Welcome everyone to Authors on the Air. I'm your host, Pam Stack. We're proud to be part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Sitting with me today is one of my longtime favorite authors, Nick Perog. Hi, Nick. How are you? Hi, Pam. A long time ago, Nick was on this show because he wrote a book called 3 AM about his character was Henry Binns. Since that time, you've added a ton more to that series. You also introduced us to Thomas Prescott, and that's who we're here to talk about today. Nick's new book is called Jungle Up, and it is the next in his series of Thomas Prescott books. Welcome back. It's good to see you. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. Uh, it's been a long time since I talked to you. You've written so many books since then. Yeah, I suppose I've been somewhat busy. <laughs> Select selectively busy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, first of all, how are your puppies doing? My puppies are doing great. They're getting up there in uh, years. They're One just turned 14 and one turns 14 here in November. But, uh, yeah, they're doing great. Just so we're getting little messages in. Um, if my producer will put those back up, please. Um, you have one from Donna Miller who says, "Woo hoo!" <laughs> and then the next one is from Gordy Brown, "Love Henry." So that's nice. And Thomas Prescott, "Jungle Up," just got five stars for me. Thank you so much, Gordy. Um, and it gets five oh, stars cool. for me. So let's back up a little bit because I want to introduce. You, you and our listeners and viewers to T Henry Binns. So Henry Binns was your first really widely received book, correct? No, the Thomas Press. So I wrote the first Thomas Prescott book in 2003. So Did you really? which was the, which one is the first one? I wrote Unforeseen right after I graduated college. That's right. I remember now. And then um, I wrote Gray Matter. The second one, I actually wrote, I wrote three Thomas Prescott books before I started the Henry Ben series. My goodness. You know, I think I read them after I read the 3 a.m. The Henry right. Ben series. I think I binged on them all. I went <laughs> one right after the other and binged on them. Went on I, a Paraga Palooza. I did. I went a Paraga Palooza for sure. So uh, Donna Miller, love all of your books. You're on the list of my top 10 of all time favorite authors. Me too, Donna. Top 10. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> there you go. You're, you're getting it. All right. Let's go back though, because I do want to talk about Henry Binns. This is probably the most unique book I've ever had the pleasure of reading at, and now series. So would you give everyone a little peek about Henry Binns and what Henry Binns is? Because Henry Binns is a name and it's also the character, right? So Henry Binns is the name of the disease that the main character has. So Henry Binns has a sleep disorder where he sleeps for 23 hours a day. So he's only awake from 3 a.m. until 4 a.m. So he has to pack his entire existence in six, into 60 minutes. So he has to take care of himself, eat, work out, make money, try to find romance, and solve a murder mystery with the president. So it's just, it's a pretty cool concept because he falls asleep at 4 a.m. no matter where he's at. So it causes him all sorts of predicaments, <laughs> when he's uh, trying to investigate the president. And, uh, you know, I I didn't anticipate how much people would love the concept and the story. And I didn't know if I would have enough content to, to write the story past the first book. And then I just kept going and it's five books now. And People would just go crazy over it, and it was just optioned by Sony Pictures Television to be a to possibly be a TV series. Knock on wood, fingers yes, crossed. Yes, your fingers crossed on that one. And uh, there's this relationship between Henry and his cat Lassie <laughs> that is uh, pretty unique and probably one of the funnest things to write 
ever. So, um, yeah, it's just a pretty unique concept. And they always say up the ante with the things that your character has to deal with. And by only having 60 minutes a day to live, to exist, you know, can't really up the ante much higher than that. So it just has tension baked into it from page one. It really does. It's interesting how um, Henry has his life timed to the second, whether it's getting up to go to the bathroom, take a shower, brush his teeth, get something to eat, you know, work on his trading, talk to his yeah. dad, whatever. It's just, <laughs> I think my life is, you know, filled with stuff because I'm answering 300 emails a day requesting interviews. That's nothing compared to what Henry is doing. So you've managed to to bring him into a new story by five minutes every time. Is it by five minutes? The new books are five minutes apart? Oh, no, they're just random. Random numbers, okay. okay. Yeah, so 3 a.m., 3.10 a.m., 3.21 a.m., 3.34 a.m. Well, yeah, there you go, yeah. yeah. Um, Sarah Potter says, I stumbled across the Thomas Prescott series and now have binged on all of your books. Good for you, me too. And then uh, hooked on your books, waiting for the next from Diff Defenda. I don't can't tell who that is. So you're getting lots of comments. I'm glad I'm hooked on your books, too. Uh, you have plans to put out a couple more of the Henry Binns books. So there's going to be a sixth and a seventh. There's going to be a 3.53 a.m. and a 4 a.m., which I've had outlined sort of this larger story arc for since I started the second book and I was just getting ready to start writing 3:53 AM at the tail end of 2018. And then that's when I landed this big three book deal for the Thomas Prescott series. And I had to just switch gears. So no promises. I might have a window to write 3:53 AM this spring, but most likely I, I won't be able to get back to Henry Benz until after I finish two more Prescott novels. So but it's going to be worth the wait. It is going to be. They scary. always are worth the wait. There's no doubt they're always worth the wait. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, those books are available. Tell everybody where they can get the Henry Benz books while we're talking about them. Uh, they're available on all platforms as eBooks, easy to get as paperbacks on Amazon. And then, um, yeah, you can find them pretty much everywhere. And okay. then- we're, we're also, um, let's see, Rita Teague says, I love and I read and loved every book you've written. Can't wait for more Hen until Henry is ready. Yeah, me too, Rita, I hear you. Um, no pressure, Nick, but I'm eating 3 a.m. in Prescott. Love the characters. Meow, meow, Gordy. <laughs> Thanks. I guess you know what that means. I don't know. <laughs> Other than Lassie. Right. Um, so how does writing any of more of the Ben's book affect your contract with Sony? Should they go ahead and decide to make this into a television series? Uh, it does not affect the deal whatsoever. Okay. So They've bought the dramatic rights. They have the option for the next, they renewed the op, they optioned the rights for a year in 2020. They just renewed the option May of this year. And so they have um, eight more months to pull the trigger and they have pretty much carte blanche. So I can continue the story. It doesn't affect what- It doesn't what affect what happens, whether it goes on television or not. Right. They can. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I understand that. Um, uh, I'm friends with the guy who wrote Dexter and um, he went every time I talked to him, he says, that's not how I wrote the book. It's not how I wrote the book. Right. Okay. Yeah. I understand. So. Jeff. Don't worry. You know? <laughs> so they have kind of, you sign it away unless you have our writing in some kind of control. So I get that. Um, you started writing Thomas before 3 a.m., but I found you, and Thomas, I found Thomas after I found 3 a.m. I want to go back and talk about Thomas Prescott because he's a pretty interesting guy. Um, he has a little bit of your personality trait. We've talked about this before. You know, he's kind of a, 
a joker. He likes to kid around and everything. But tell me how Thomas formed in your mind. So Thomas is probably, I've, we have the exact same sense of humor. He just says things out loud that I think in my head. But um, so we have a lot of the same sensibilities. He's more of an alpha where I'm probably more of like a Charlie. <laughs> he's a, he's a, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm a little less confrontational than him, but I just had always loved reading those first person narratives with a guy who is just, you know, sarcastic, in your face, uh, confrontational first person narrative. So um, that sort of is how he started when I first came up with him, you know, 18 years ago. And then if you go back and read Unforeseen, he's pretty crass, pretty raw. And as I've matured over the last 18 years, you know, Thomas has come along for the ride. So between Unforeseen and Jungle Up, which is five years in Thomas Prescott's life, but 18 years in my life, you can just see how he's really matured and grown up, but he's never lost his uh, his serpent's tongue. That's for sure. He, he has a certain amount of swagger. That's for sure. Um, but he's also very smart. He's a very intelligent guy. He has a lot of world experience. He has a lot of knowledge and everything. So tell us Thomas Prescott's background for those who haven't read about him because we want everyone to know who he is. So he grew up in Seattle and then he became the youngest homicide detective in Seattle police department history at 26. And then his parents died in a plane crash. And he had a little sister named Lacey, who's eight and a half years younger than him. So the, the relationship between Thomas and Lacey is really one of the driving forces of the books because his little sister is the only family he has left. And uh, so then <laughs> they uh, Lacey gets a swimming scholarship and they move to Philadelphia, which oddly enough is the book that I'm writing right now. So the book I'm writing right now is actually the prequel to Unforeseen. Wow. So it takes place uh, two years before Unforeseen when Thomas Prescott is 30 and him and Lacey has, have just moved to Philadelphia and he's helping out with some cold cases and some other things um, with the Philadelphia Police Department. Excuse me. At any rate, uh, basically throughout the series, he's a retired homicide detective and he finds himself in all sorts of precarious situations. He does. You know, the first book takes him up to Maine where he has to solve a serial killer murder. The second book takes him back to Seattle where he has to deal with the death of the, the murder of the governor of Washington and all these relationships that he used to have with people in the Seattle police department. Third book takes him on a African cruise and he's on a ship called the Afrikaans that gets boarded by South African pirates that are demanding a, uh, medical relief from the United States. The fourth book is, takes us to Missouri, where Thomas has to deal with uh, cold case mysteries that are tied to big biotech and GMOs. And then uh, the latest, Jungle Up, the, uh, the doctor that he meets in the Afrikaans and the love of Thomas's life She's been working in a remote African village in Bolivia and she gets kidnapped and she's able to leave Thomas a uh, voicemail on a, she, she gets her hands on a satellite phone and leaves Thomas a voicemail to come find her. And so Thomas drops everything and finds his way down to the Bolivian Amazon and all hell breaks loose. As it, as it want to do when Thomas Prescott is involved. So Laura Suriano says, love your books and can't wait for the next one. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Karen Lee Schulte, all, love all Nick's books. So excited to hear there are more Thomas and more Henry books in the future. You're welcome. 
Um, I love this book. I, I devoured it. It reminded me I hadn't read a Thomas book for a while. And so when I sat down to read it, I was immediately familiar with um, Thomas's kind of wit and sarcasm and kind of, I don't care what you say, I'm going to get it done and how he talks his way to transport to the Bolivian Amazon. Come hell or high water, he's going to figure it out. Always with his ear out wondering, you know, what's the other guy's motive? It, it was right. really, it grabs you right from the start, right from the start. And um, the, I thought, well, I'll take a break, you know, and I'll make some lunch for myself. And then lunchtime became like eight o'clock in the evening. And by that time I was rounding the end of it. And you know, I thought, oh, well, I'll eat tomorrow. I want to find right. out what happens, you know? So it was a lot of fun to read. And um, so I'm really glad. Let's talk about Jungle Up a little bit more. So Thomas is living his life. He's not happy that she's not with him. Um, they, you know, Gina has determined she's going to go on and, and continue to help these poverty stricken people, these poor people who live in Bolivia, who don't have access to medical care. She's their one regular doctor. He ain't happy about it though. He doesn't want her there. He wants her home. He wants to be with her. No, and she broke, she broke his heart. She broke picked, his heart. Yeah. She picked, uh, she picked this small, Amazonian people village, she picked those people over Thomas. So he's he's been heartbroken for a couple of years before yeah. this book starts. But of course, he doesn't also get her message right away. So let's talk about that. Yeah, so he he gets her message and by the time he gets it, you know, Thomas, I've been abducted. Find me, please find me it's been five days since she's, she's been abducted. So he's already behind the eight ball and he's, he needs to figure out how to get down to Bolivia as fast as possible. And one of the ways that he, if you go through normal bureaucracy, getting a, a visa to get in country and then all the flights, you know, it's, it's going to be a week before he can get boots on the ground in Bolivia through normal channels. So he calls in a favor and he's able to catch a flight down to Bolivia on one of these documentary expeditions. And so he's able to get down there within 24 hours. And this documentary ex expedition, they're actually looking for the lost city of Paititi, which is um, the last refuge of the Incas. And so those two storylines come together. And once, once they get to Bolivia, Thomas goes his way, the expedition goes their way, but they're destined to, uh, they're find each clash other again. later on in the novel. And, they're going to uh, clash again. You're going to tie up all the loose ends as you always do. Do you have, do you recall how you formed the character of Thomas Crescott? Where his storyline came from? So when I first formed Thomas Prescott, I was in love with Nelson DeMille's main oh. character, John Corey. Yeah. So um, I sort of, you know, <laughs> Thomas Prescott is sort of a mashup between John Corey and Janet Ivanovich's Stephanie Plum because... Okay. He's just silly. He's a little bit more self-deprecating. He's tough, but he's also, he's not afraid of making a fool of himself. And he's, he's, uh, <laughs> he's like, he's really tough, but he has this underlining. Um, he's a softer well, underbelly, I think. Right. For sure. Yeah. He's, um, He's definitely the hero and the anti-hero at the same time. So, yeah. uh, which is a odd combination that I didn't, which wasn't premeditated at all. It just sort of ended that way because I, <laughs> I'm sort of a weenie in my own right. So that comes <laughs> out, <laughs> that comes out in Thomas just organically. 
And one of my favorite scenes, spoiler alert, but in Jungle Up, Thomas Prescott contracts dengue fever. Oh, yeah, and right. he's just it's such miserable. a wolf dealing with this virus. <laughs> and um, it causes him to do some strange things, but he's just, yeah, just like, you know, the tough guy who gets the flu and thinks he's dying. Yes. With him. But um, yeah. <laughs> that was so. those are some funny scenes, by the way, I have to tell you. Um, and, and all kidding aside, dengue is very serious. It's, it's a, just as a side note, my poor sister-in-law has uh, is from Jamaica originally. She was down there checking on her father. She, she got Zika and dengue at the same time. And it was patient zero in Miami and was miserable. It, you know, you describe the symptoms correctly, but compound that with another, you know, m mosquito borne disease. It was, poor thing was just horrible. Wow. And I, yeah. And, and my brother's not one of those. who's like a really bleeding heart, sympathetic guy. He'll take care. But um, Sarah Potter says that was so funny when he was sick. Yes, it was. It was one of the funniest scenes. Hi, Susie. How are you? You have to go ahead and read these books. You're going to love it. Susie, a girl I went to high school with, is commenting. Oh, hi, Susie. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, join the, jo join join the bandwagon. The, join the craziness. Join the craziness. Right. So um, when I spoke to you about, about writing, your writing habits, you admitted to me that you are a slacker. <laughs> you just really, you, you really don't want to sit down and write. You just want to go and have it done. So um, I just want to come up with the idea, which is the funnest part of right. the whole process is, you know, coming up with the movie in your head. And that's when you get, I mean, it's almost euphoric, euphoric when you're coming up with that story. So um, yeah, it's been, each book is a different challenge. Jungle Up, you know, there was more research I had to do more research for Jungle Up than probably all my books previously combined because there's so many different story elements that I had no idea about. You know, I had to put myself in the Bolivian jungle. I had to research Incas. I had to research documentary expedition. I had to research, um, I don't want to give anything away, but there's three or four more things that, right. you know, I just had to inundate myself with. So, um, yeah, as for writing habits and being a slacker, uh, the challenge for the book I'm writing right now has just been, you would think that COVID would be a blessing in disguise for an author, you know? You can't leave your house, you know? So, But you've got the butt. lake right there, so you're gone. <laughs> yeah, get your butt in the seat and start writing. But um, So yeah, I like to write for about three hours every other day. In a perfect Every other world. day, <laughs> yeah. Jeez. But um, I love yeah, it. You get you're, it done. You're selling books. People love them. You have a huge fan base, including me. So whatever you're doing, keep doing it. I just know? always want it to be fun. I never want it to feel like work. So I always want to be excited when I'm sitting down to write. But hey, that's the way I feel about doing this. You know, here I am, almost three thousand author interviews in. And it hasn't gotten boring yet. So nice. You know, you just do what you do because you love it. I, and that's the important thing. Um, when you do research, how long do you let your research go before you say, okay, enough? Because let's face it, Google is your best friend and your worst friend. You could be Googling Inca information and be there for a year. You could have, you could write a book on Incas if you wanted to. Right, right. When do you, what do you, how do you know what to pick and choose and use for your book? So sort of the strategy is you have to familiar, familiar, familiarize yourself with these topics beforehand. So, you know, just a broad, you know, just watching documentaries, reading books about the Incas, not, not picking and choosing specific facts and things before you start writing, but just soaking up a broad knowledge of, you know, the Amazon, Bolivia, all these different story elements um, beforehand. And then the detail really comes out after the first and second drafts when you've 
created this framework and then you pick and choose, okay, now I need to start pulling these specific details from the Incas uh, that I need to showcase to the reader. So there's just such, there's so much information out there on all these different topics that you have to be really um, strategic about what you decide to put into the book because you don't want to bore the reader. You don't want to right. spend three or four pages on, you know, the minutia of what happened to the Incas right. and their downfall. Right, right. So, um, basically, you want a broad knowledge before you start writing because you're going to waste a lot of time if you don't do, a, you know, some research beforehand. And then after the first draft, you really start plugging in those details at least uh, every author has a different strategy that right that's right do you outline is it a detailed outline or is it a bullet point kind of an outline so i i i outline quite i outline everything what is the word i'm thinking of detailed? i outline considerably <laughs> So I have the whole big picture outlined. I have each chapter outlined. Um, it has to be a, it has to be able to move. It has to be elastic because it's going to change as you do write the story. But writing a mystery thriller with misdirections and red herrings, um, you definitely need, at least I have to outline considerably or I would lose the scope of the novel. There's some authors that just, you know, they have the characters and then they just let them play and go with the story. But for me to, I have to be very organized as I move forward. When you're writing and you're following your outline, do you ever find yourself saying, well, here I am now and the character is not allowing me to do that or the character doesn't feel natural or intrinsic to that character. Do you find Yeah, absolutely. I had to do a, I had to delete about a third of Jungle Up just because it wasn't working. So I had to go back to the drawing board on Jungle Up, recalibrate Thomas, the story, and then move forward. So each, each book is its own triathlon sometimes yeah. it it works and you don't cramp up other times you know you uh you get to the running portion and you got to go back and swim it, a couple more laps um carla says addicted to thomas prescott great character are you going to write any more in the series yes two more carla so that works so the next one uh in philadelphia is called the numbers uh it's a prequel to unforeseen thomas is investigating a serial killer that's tied to the old numbers racket, as well as a murder of a co-ed during Occupy Wall Street. So it's going to be, wow. I'm actually headed to Philadelphia in three weeks to do a research trip. And uh, I'm really excited for that. Do you often go where your character goes? I mean, I'm assuming you didn't go to the Bolivian Amazon. Maybe you did, but um, would will you travel to do background in a perfect world i would travel to every every uh, location every yeah. setting and i think moving forward i i will be able to it's just they a lot of there's this old adage that authors should write what they know and write what they're familiar with which i think is no fun at all i want to write what i'm unfamiliar with so it's been so fun. You know, I went to Maine to research Thomas Prescott. I went to Seattle. You know, I wish I was tough and less of a hypochondriac. I would have gone to the Bolivian Amazon for a couple of weeks. But I, I think that was that probably not, smart. <laughs> that would not have ended well. Um, well, you know, 
And that's funny. It's great to walk in your character's footsteps. I think that's an amazing thing. But let's face it, if you're writing historical romance, there's no way you're going back in time. Nor right. if, you're writing pan if you're writing dystopian or science fiction, you can't go to another planet or create one for yourself. But you know, writing what you know, I, I guess that's a good thing. But I, I think knowing your character is writing what you know more than anything else. And let's face it, you can't be Henry Benz. You can't sleep for 23 hours and then cram one hour of your life in. Every, you could try it, I suppose. But yeah, I think uh, you, I, I think that might be a dare. Is that a might, dare, Pam? It, it might be. You All can right, try right. it. And when you come back, you can tell me how that worked out. We'll do a follow up in a couple of right. weeks and tell me. But um, do you still get a kick out of finishing up your books and polishing them off and then sending them out into the world? Is it fun for you to know that someone is reading your books for enjoyment and kind of laughing and then saying, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? Oh, it's. It's an absolute blast. There's nothing better than getting a message or a fake Facebook message from someone that says, you know, your book just had me laughing out well, <laughs> laughing out loud. I just love Thomas. I mean, for me, I want them to like the story, but if I can make someone laugh, that that's that's my favorite part of it. And uh yeah, so Cammy Hall says, hey, Nick, your books are magical. There you go. I agree, Cammy. They are. They are magical. There's just something um, for a mystery thriller and to insert the humor into it, it is just so much fun. It, it breaks up the tension. And yes, I know every the, the many thriller authors I've had on here who say, I want to ratchet up the tension and keep it going and keep it going. I have to tell you, there's something to be said for taking a break, letting your heart level normal out a little bit and just kind of say, this guy's really human. I mean, he has a serious side. He has a determined side. He has an obnoxious side, but he also has a playful side too. And he really does have a soft underbelly like we were talking about. So I really like that a lot. And the same with Henry Binns. In the short period of time, he has to be awake he does show all those different characteristics. So you interact a lot with your fans on your pages, don't you? I try to. Do yes. you like to do signings? Do you like to go out into the world and meet people? Or are you a little bit on the shy side about that? So I'm super introverted. Like, I mean, before quarantine, quarantine didn't change my life much. It was basically... <laughs> how I live. You know, I just, me and my dogs, I don't need to see people for, you know, weeks at a time. So uh, as far as doing signings and stuff, uh, with this first book with Blackstone, you know, COVID sort of threw a kink in the, you know, book tour. So I did a virtual, uh, virtual interview and stuff like that. So to answer your question, I will be open to it. I'll be excited to do a book tour and do some signings right now. Every Friday I'm selling books at the local farmer's market. Oh, how fun. Pretty fun. Just, you know, to get out there for five hours on a Friday. And I live in a really touristy town in South, South Lake Tahoe. So people come from all over the U S and globally and to sell them books has been a lot of fun. And every once in a while, like last Friday, I had a lady that came by my booth and she saw my books. She goes, Oh, I've read, I've read all these already. <laughs> and it was weird. I was like, you know, it's still surreal to hear that a random person has already read all my books. So yeah, I get a kick out of that, but as an introvert, it's, it's very draining for me after, being around people for five hours, I'm exhausted and I just want to come home and, you know, uh, close the windows, mm -hmm. yeah. lock the doors, right? Right. Absolutely. In, in your spare time, I know you mentioned you played with the dogs and you go to the lake. Do you have any other hobbies? I mean, I'm a voracious reader and I just love stories. So, you know, I love a good binge of anything on, I might be the only person that I think I have, subs I have a subscription to 
Netflix, Hulu, Paramount, Peacock, Disney. Like, I mean, I just love stories and I love watching uh, stuff. I love reading. I work out a lot. I swim in the lake a lot. I play with my dogs. I golf. You golf? Really? I do. Yeah. Yeah. So. That's interesting. Hey, you know, did you always know you wanted to be a writer? Was that your intention when you went to college? It was always a calling. I knew I was going to be, I knew I had to be a writer when I was around 14 years old, which is both a, both a blessing and a curse because, you know, all your eggs are in one basket. It's just, it's one of those things that I was always going to be a writer, you know, so failure wasn't an option. I went to business school, did not enjoy it one bit. If I did go to class, I would bring a book and just get, go in the back row and just read the entire time. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I can't believe it worked out. Got a couple of lucky breaks, but yeah, I, uh, when I was, my books, my life revolved around playing basketball and reading. I mean, playing sports and reading my entire youth. And I would read, you know, two boxcar children books in one day and then go shoot baskets for three hours. That's, those were my two loves. Wow. And I then, think that's uh, great. My, I mean, I've always, you know how much I read. So I mean, 400 I read books, 400 <laughs> books a year. That is and no television. Yeah. So I yeah. still, so, since we first met years ago, I still don't have a television and I'm okay with that. I probably could access it from my laptop. And then I think there'll be a commercial or somebody will say something stupid. And I think I got to go read a book. You know, I, just, <laughs> I can't right. do it. I, right. I am happy in these crazy political times that I don't watch the news or anything. I'm not unaware of what's going on. I have news feeds, but I get to pick and choose the ones that are least offensive to me and still right. deliver me the news, you know? I don't blame you. <clears throat> okay. When can we expect, how long does it take you to write a book or do you take the year to write one? I do. Uh, so that book took me about a year. The book I'm writing right now is scheduled for release September 6, 2022. And, uh, this one has taken me about a year and a half. So each one's different. And I actually pushed my deadline back on this book just to let it breathe. And it was the best thing that I could have done. You know, once you give a story time to breathe, you see it from a different light, you see it objectively, you can come up with, you know, uh, a couple different twists and stuff. It's an interesting concept. I've not ever heard that before. I've heard people who, who say a deadline is good. It pushes them to, to get the story done. But when I think about what you said about letting the story breathe, kind of marinate a little bit and make sure it's at its sweet spot, then you go on. That makes sense to me also. Do you happen by any chance to read your dialogue to, to see what it sounds like to you? Do you read it out loud? Uh. I do not, but I guess that would be a great tool. <laughs> I, it, it works for some people. I mean, I, because I, I don't listen to audiobooks, but I do listen. I do like to read really good prose. So occasionally um, I will read uh, a dialogue out loud just to try it on for size and see how it works. And uh, it also fires a different part of your brain. So I'd like doing that. I was just curious. Nick, I am so happy you came back to my show. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This was a blast. Tell everybody where they can find you first on, on the interwebs and also where they can go and buy all of your books. So my personal website is nickprog.com. Uh, my books are available pretty much anywhere you can find them. If you want a signed paperback, you can go to my bookstore, which is nickparagbookstore.com, and I'll personalize a paperback for you and send it to you. 
I am going to go to your bookstore because I don't <laughs> have a signed Nick book. So I have to find one. Um, thanks so much. Will you come back when your next book comes out or when you find out that your books are actually going to be on television, whichever comes first? I would be delighted to come back on your show and uh, yes, whenever, but. Okay. By the way, whose book was Whose books are you reading right now? Who are you reading? Who am I reading? Uh, that's a good question. My favorite author right now would probably be, oh my gosh, Andrew Main. Are you familiar with Andrew Main? Yes. Yes. So I love his uh, Underwater Investigation series. And yep. then he's got a great series with... Uh, a character named Theo Cray. And then the best book I've read in a long time was Project Hail Mary by Andy Weir. It was just, you know, his follow up, not his follow up, but his latest and greatest, The Author right. of the Martian. Yeah, of the Martian. So I love that. And then I love, I always have a couple. I love sci fi. I love. Do you uh, really? post-apocalyptic stuff so do I. and then uh really this love this time it. travel this time travel series by nick jones uh oh yes oh my gosh the most recent book is wonderful isn't it yeah so yeah. definitely check out the uh the vanishing girl it's yeah fantastic yeah yeah well we have a lot of books in common including thomas prescott and henry benz <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for being with me, Nick. I truly appreciate it. And thank you all to your, your fans who have been dropping notes. Um, Rita said, enjoy seeing you and hearing you, Nick, keep writing. Um, we will Rita. Thanks Gordy. Great time. Thanks Pam and Nick. You're welcome, Gordy. Thanks. And I will see you again soon. I want to thank everyone for being with me today along with Nick and thank you, mom and dad.